the Michigan Political History Society is pleased to present this presentation today of the life and times of Frank Kelly, 37 years Attorney General of the State of Michigan. The interview will be conducted by Leon Cohen, who served as Frank Kelly's deputy for many years. Before we talk about the Attorney General years, Frank, why don't you give us an idea about your personal background, where you came from, the circumstances that brought you to the Attorney General's office? I came from Detroit originally. I was born in Detroit uh, December 31st, 1924, when Detroit was the motor capital of the world, you might say. Ironically, the day I was born, the Detroit News carried a story, it was New Year's Eve of 24, that Detroit is the richest city in the United States, uh, and perhaps the world, had the highest per capita incomes of any place in the world, more home ownership, more of the attributes of wealth than any place else in the world. It was most interesting. So I, I was born and raised in Detroit during the, the Roaring Twenties, the Golden Years, and then, of course, during the Depression. My father was a second generation American. His father come, came, father and mother had both come from County Mayo, Ireland, back in the 1880s and my father was born in Detroit in 1893. My grandfather died in an industrial accident in his early 40s, and his mother, uh, my grandmother, died of what they call childbirth fever uh, in the birth of one of their, their children. And ironically, uh, childbirth fever was nothing but the failure of, of physicians or midwives to, to sterilize or wash their hands. Louis Pasteur in France was begging doctors to, to wash their hands because he discovered bacteria and the doctors thought, well, what does this Frenchman know, you know? It's similar to the way things are today. But uh, so uh, my father and his brothers and sisters were, were, were orphaned. My father was nine years old when he lost his mother and father. So he had to hustle and sell newspapers in the city of Detroit in front of City Hall when he was 10 years old. But he grew up and he became a successful businessman. And I was born, as I said, in, in 24. My father had an interest in politics and uh, so much so that in 1948, when uh, Truman was to be nominated on his own after succeeding Franklin and Roosevelt upon his death, 1948, he had to be nominated on his own. It was the first televised convention, convention in Philadelphia. And my father headed up to the Michigan delegation. He had white hair just like I do. And in the black and white television in those days, he showed up quite a bit at Michigan's, at the head of the de delegation. I was a senior in law school, and I can remember my dad standing up at this convention under the Klieg lights in Philadelphia saying Michigan cast its 22 votes for that great commoner Harry S. Truman, so on and so forth. So it was kind of an exciting night for my father. He later got to know Truman, campaigned a little bit with him. And so I had that kind of a background where politics was a part of the family. And among the Irish uh, in those days and perhaps to some extent to, even to this day, public service was always considered a high calling, higher than commerce or higher than business if you could be successful as a public servant. My father always said it was because Ireland was discriminated against for 500 years and you couldn't hold public office, you weren't allowed to vote, a lot of other deprivations, which made the uh, Irish yearn for public service. And when they got to this country, that's why so many of them got into it. And uh, I know I talked to the Kennedys one time and uh, their father, Joe Kennedy, used to preach to them about how valuable public service was and how, what, a, what a great contribution to mankind it was. My father always talked that way. So he wanted me to be a lawyer, but he wanted me to be a public lawyer. And uh, ironically, the one year after uh, I became a lawyer, my father had a heart attack suddenly and passed away. But I remembered uh, his ambitions for me and I tried to fulfill them. Where did you go to school, Frank? I went to the University of Detroit, which was the place where all young Catholic boys and girls went back in those days. Uh, that was the university and I, I went there and I got my two degrees there. And what did you do after you got out of law, out of law school? Uh, when I got out of law school, uh, uh, I said my father was still alive. I worked for three uh, lawyers in the, the old Dime Bank building, which is on the, right across what would be City Hall. I think there's a skating rink there right now. The building still stands. I worked for three lawyers for about a year and a half. And then I wanted to be a trial lawyer, and I got this idea, if I wanted to be a trial lawyer, I could only do it one of two ways. I could get a job in the prosecutor's office and work over in the recorder's courthouse, where all the criminal cases were. That's where most trial lawyers were developed. Or I could go out to the country, take up a country law practice, and learn to be a trial lawyer up in the country. So I, I opted for the country routine because I read a book about it of a small town lawyer at the turn of the century in America who led an idyllic life being a trial lawyer in mid-America. My father didn't like the idea, but then with his sudden passing, uh, the, wor the, the, the road was clear for me. And before he died, my dad said to my mother, tell Frank it's okay to go 
to Alpena, which I wanted to go to practice law. So I went to Alpena, and I set up a law practice with a classmate. And I, my partner and I were the only Democratic lawyers in the county of about 20 lawyers. But we did very well practicing law there. Were you in politics all during this time? I tried to be active, you know, and, and at the time when I moved into northeastern Michigan, it was primarily a Republican area, and I came from a solid Democratic area, so I was very diplomatic. But I did go to the party conventions. I was a delegate, and if somebody asked me, I told them I was a Democrat. But uh, I didn't run for office up there because I thought it would be rather futile, so I, I didn't do it. But uh, I was there about a year and a half, and the city council came in, and the mayor, all of whom are Republicans, I'm sure, and uh, they asked me to be city attorney. And they said to me, I said to them, I said, well, why would you want me to be city attorney? I'm a Democrat. You're all Republican, gentlemen. They said, well, we watched you. He said, we'll, we'll get, put it this way, uh, Frank. He said, you take care of the law, and we'll take care of the politics. So I, I said, well, if you have that much trust in me, I'll do it. So I was city attorney for the next seven years until I got appointed attorney general. And believe it or not, that the tolerant act by that group of Republicans to make me city attorney. I always remembered it years later when I worked with you in the Capitol. I always remember it, don't judge a book by its cover and don't be too political. Remember there's good people on both sides of the aisle. Right. What were the circumstances that led to your appointment of att as attorney general? It was very interesting. John Swainson was elected governor in 1960 when John F. Kennedy was elected president. And John had the, uh, the role of, of taking the place of uh, G. Menor Williams, who had been a Democratic icon uh, here in Michigan, having been elected more times than any other governor, six times. Ironically, there were, uh, unfortunately, I should say, there were only two-year terms. So in 12 years, G. Menor Williams ran, ran uh, six times for governor and got elected every time. 1960, he tried to run for president of the United States and it didn't work out. But at that, so John Swainson, who was his lieutenant governor, ran for governor in 60 when Kennedy was elected. Uh, during his term, the Republican Party uh, felt that by gosh, we haven't had control of the governor's office in 12 years now. We've got this new young governor. Maybe if we snip enough at him, we might be able to get the governorship back. And so they began attacking poor John Swainson right off the bat when he was governor. And they especially attacked his appointments. Whenever he'd appoint somebody to a judge, he'd say, oh, he appointed an unqualified person. This is terrible, terrible, terrible. And this went on for about eight or 10 months. Well, then the attorney general at the time, Paul Adams, uh, uh, wanted to be on the Supreme Court. So Sure enough, somebody retired from the Supreme Court, and uh, Swainson made uh, Paul Adams, then Attorney General, a member of the Supreme Court, creating a vacancy. Well, then Swainson got together with all his leaders and, and, and his advisors, and they said, well, our, every one of our appointments is getting criticized. We can't, what's wrong? So he said, well, let's, uh, let's avoid all that, all that criticism. I'm going to set up a committee, and we're going to pick 20 lawyers from around the state, that committee. And that, that, that committee will interview and pare down the lawyers and they'll come up with a final three recommendations, and those final three or four will be interviewed by the governor appointed. That way, nobody can criticize the appointment of the attorney general. Well, that turned out to be lucky for me because they had to get names from all over the state. And sure enough, they picked my name uh, out of a hat from Alpena, Michigan. And uh, it was in uh, December of uh, 1961. I'm sitting in my little country law office in, Alp in Alpena, and I get a call from then Zoltan Ferency, who was at that time Governor Swainson's executive secretary. And he said, Frank Kelly? I said, yes. He said, I'm telling you something in confidence. You've been selected as a member of 20 people who are name is being considered for appointment as Attorney General of Michigan. You're not to say a word about it, and you keep it under your hat, and we'll notify you if you, cut, if you survive the cut next week. So 10 days or so later, I'd forgotten about it. I get a call. Mr. Kelly, yeah, you've survived the cut. It's down to 10 now. We don't want you to say anything. But if it gets down to 5 or 6, we'll let you know. So I forgot about it, and I thought it was nice to be honored, but I thought it was just going to be sophistry, you know. Lo and behold, a day after Christmas in 1961, I get a call, Mr. Kelly out, so you to come down to Lansing, you're one of four or five finalists, you're to be interviewed by the governor and the committee as to, for the possible appointment of with Office of Attorney General. And that's when I came down to Lansing, like on the 27th, day, two days after Christmas, I brought my wife down, and I was interviewed by the governor and this panel of two national committee men, and I think it was Mildred Jeffrey, Neil Stabler, leaders of the party, you know. What kind of questions did they ask you? Oh, they were about as business-like as they could be without being too political, you know. What is your background? What is your attitude towards the law? And, uh, you know, how do you view the role of attorney general? You know, kind of being routine. Actually, what they were doing is probably looking to see if uh, uh, there was anything really bad about me. 